378 at cornell.edu. We have the pleasure of going to England tonight to talk about the gardens of Downton Abbey. Now, some of you may know that Downton Abbey was, uh, is a fictitious name for what is in reality a place known as High Clare Castle. I hope that reminded many of you, those of you who enjoyed the series of some of the characters that indeed occupied us for a number of seasons, whether it was the staff upstairs, I mean, and everyone who lived upstairs or those who worked downstairs uh, to make that such a very uh, wonderful series of programs on public television. There are some who have told me they love the series, if only to see what the women were wearing in each uh, episode. And you remember, so many of the interiors of Highclere Castle were absolutely exquisite, wonderful places to film a series. You see the hall empty and then uh, decorated at uh, Christmas time. But we're going outside uh, tonight to talk about uh, Downton Abbey or High Clare Castle and what's very special or unique about it. Now, this is the current family, the Carnarvons, who own High Clare, and their family has been there since the 17th century. Surely, no newcomers to High Clare. And uh, the circle in the center represents approximately uh, where High Clare is located. On the far right side, we have London and the town of Bath on your far left. Or take a look here, you get a better sense of where High Clare Castle is located in England. If we could magically go back to the year 749 into medieval times, we would have seen that that space was occupied by the bishops of Winchester. It was a medieval palace and gardens. Now this representation is not, is, an, is uh, not what was at Highclere Castle. That was it's long ago uh, been destroyed, but this is probably representative of what would have been found on the space. The building that the Carnarvons first built was in 1679 and they called the place High Clare Place House. Take a look at that structure. It's not nearly as elaborate as the buildings we know now, you know, kind of like two and a half stories uh, of a building. And let me show you another slide of it, right? This is an, an illustration. And you see the sheep grazing in the foreground. I will say this now and say it again later. It was for this building, this structure, that the grand gardens at High Clare were designed and not the building that you are more familiar with. So let's talk about one, what one might really consider the gardens of Downton Abbey. And I'm gonna put a red circle around them, right? My guess is most of it would say, there's, there we go to the gardens of Downton Abbey. And let me take you to this spot first. This was known as the Monk's Garden at uh, Downton Abbey, the Monk's Garden. And so named the Monk's Garden because that's in fact where the monks grew many of the vegetables and fruits that they would enjoy throughout the year in medieval times. <laughs> They were very fond of topiary and that topiary means when you shape bushes. So, you know, this may be an 800 year old uh, topiary that's been trimmed and trimmed and trimmed to look exactly like this over time. And you see that there were 61 fruit trees there uh, as well in the 1200s. This may look a little strange to us now, but this was very common, if you will, uh, in medieval times to have these sorts of uh, growths in a garden. 
so that you see then the uh, medieval garden was a, a, a square with repetition of other geometric forms. Later years, this greenhouse was added and it became a great, great place to grow peaches and fragrant roses that were used for ceremonies in the castle. Anyone who's a gardener might recognize the High Clare Collie. Uh, indeed, many were developed here and then a very famous one in 1835. Its progeny are still in the trade uh, today. Again, a monk's garden would be full of uh, a flower like lavender, which could provide scent as well as medicinal qualities and a very fragrant uh, essence or oil. Again, the topiaries repeated again and again. Outside the monk's garden, just behind the wall, is what's known as the white border garden. And there was a famous uh, designer in England by the name of Gertrude Jekyll who only designed white garden borders. Whatever color um, many others liked, she said, no, white is absolutely beautiful and would have shades of gray in it as well. And here's a sort of a modern interpretation that was added just beyond the uh, monk's garden. And here's another view of it. But again, you see, it's not particularly big looking from the other direction. Then just at the edge of the um, white garden is an entrance into a secret garden. This is more familiar to many of us. We have these beautiful borders on left and right, you know, with an area of grass in between. And we see the beautiful shocks of color, the whites and the purples, and you see the cosmos on your uh, left-hand side, hydrangea in the distance. And indeed, if you remember from the series, this was a great place to have tea uh, to settle family uh, disputes or discussions. And again, here, absolutely beautiful in the summer uh, with that stand of Minarda or Bee Balm close to us. The current family added something called the Wood of Goodwill. Uh, which is an area devoted almost exclusively to British trees. That is what is native in Britain and beaches and oak were added in this area. But what constitutes the garden at High Clare really is not what I've just shared with you. The garden is something else and let me take you. So what many have recognized about High Clare Castle is that what we might at first think is the garden really is something different. You know, let your eyes go outside of that earlier circle and recognize that the entire property is a garden. Again, the entire property is manicured as a garden. And this represents what was known as or became to be known as the English landscape garden, wherein the whole of the estate, the whole of the property was thought of as the garden. And in the case of High Clare, we're talking about a pretty sizable area. It's more like a park than it, what you and I might call a, a garden. And it began a movement in landscape architecture. And what's significant about this is that the architect who I'll, I'll introduce to you made so many of his changes look as if they were natural, when in fact, he and his crew dramatically changed the property. So that with new eyes then, look at this photograph. I want to draw your attention to in front of the castle, do you see that scooped area uh, kind of where the lawn is? That wasn't there naturally, nor was the way in which the grass 
in the foreground and the background gently un unfolds. That was sculpted, rocks removed, soil placed, so that it would have the curvature that you do in fact see. And the designer who did all this was none other than Lancelot Brown, otherwise known as Capability Brown, uh, who lived as you see 1716 to 1873. He is today still one of Britain's most talented landscape architects because it is in fact he who forever changed the face of Britain. And it was Capability Brown who helped us define what we today think of the grand English country estate. So you can see from this spotting map, uh, Capability Brown designed anywhere between 170 and 300 of the finest, most exquisite places in Britain. And you get a sense of them from the uh, spotting map here. His contracts earned him a great deal of money, as you see there. And I, and I have to tell you that he earned the name Capability because he was very clever. And when he would be describing to a potential client what he could do with your property, he would say something like, well, your property is capable of this and it's capable of that. And hence uh, the moniker that uh, we know him by today. So if in fact, at least a half a million acres in the UK was redesigned by Brown, he, has been considered one, if not the most prolific English landscape designers. And yet, my guess is many in this audience tonight may never have heard of them. And that may be in part because his efforts were so natural that you, you would think in fact that they were done by the hand of, of, of the ages rather than this landscape architect who with hand tools and his crew uh, made a much more impressive landscape. So why was he so influential? Because he recognized it was not enough to change a little area here or there on a property, but rather make the whole property a statement. He believed in simple and uncluttered lines he was very modern, if you will, in many ways, even though he was working in the 1700s, making all of his changes seem as if they were absolutely natural. Another reason why he was so influential is what Brown was suggesting to his clients was really off the page. By that, I mean his ideas were a radical departure from whatever people who had a great deal of money were doing on their property. In particular, what Brown was suggesting was nothing like what was going on in England, I'm sorry, in France or in Italy, because those were very formal gardens that wealthy people were paying for with very precise, geometric dimensions. And let me show you what I'm talking about. Here we're looking at an Italian Renaissance garden from roughly about the same time. This is the Via di Castello. All right, take a look at the estate. Obviously it figures prominently there in the center with that beautiful uh, uh, tiled roof. But imagine if you had a scissor in your hand right now. You could take your scissor if you will, on my slide, right? And kind of cut it right down the center, top to bottom. And you would have pretty much the same garden on the right as you do on the left. So too, if you took the scissors on the horizontal and cut, you'd pretty much have the same top and bottom. So these are the geometric designs that Brown is saying these are boring. 
why are people paying lots and lots of money to have such uninteresting, if you will, giant backyards? And then we go to France. Some of you may have visited uh, Versailles, you know, the fantastic estate and the gardens in the back show you exactly what was, if you will, the garden of the day. Late 1600s, if you had a lot of money, you wanted a highly geometric, formal garden that looked like, you know, this one here at Versailles, absolutely symmetrical. All right, let me ask you for the center to go into that kind of pool in the middle. If you were standing in the center of that pool, if you look north or south or east or west, you would see you'd have the exact same view of those areas that have design patterns treated with uh, you know, the grass in the center. Similarly, if you walk on any of these paths, you will see that there is a cone-shaped topiary in the center of every walkway. And that if you look to your left, you see a bush that's in a topiary, a round bush. And if you look to your right, the exact same bush. Right, left, right, left, front, back. Now, if any of you are gardeners, do you have any sense of how much maintenance a garden like this requires to keep it so symmetrically perfect. Well, Brown is saying hogwash to all of this. If my um, patrons have money, we're gonna do something different. All right, here's a, another sense, uh, a look at those uh, gardens. The geometry came or started to come to the Baroque gardens as well in, in, uh, in England. So what you see then is Brown's idea for a garden is in fact quite different from those that I just shared with you in France and in Italy. And if any of you read French, you see the uh, cut line under there, superbe jardin anglaise. So someone in France is saying, my goodness, what are these incredibly interesting gardens that are going on in England? Well, this is an example of one of Capability Brown's designs. Note that it's pretty irregular that you know, the pathways are going meandering here and there that there are shrubs that have no decided a mathematical pattern to them, but they're here and there. And occasionally we see the castle and a structure. So this is what he would be using as his design idea. Inevitably, he loved a waterway with some kind of bridge going over it. And the more I studied Brown's designs, I couldn't help but think of the blue willow patterns that some of you may know. Uh, that came out of England, which were typically blue and white, but they were reds and browns and other colors in which we see meandering paths, waterways, uh, and something of an irregular, if you will, movement through the, um, the design. That reminded me of Brown's temple pool at Weston Park, which you see here. What Brown did represented such an enormous scale of land, really transformation, that he may appear natural, that we think of as the English estate, would, however, today probably be considered environmental degradation because it was so large and so uh, radical, the transformation that he made appear as if nature created those places. These are a couple of the features that we will see in every one of Capability Brown's landscapes. You're gonna see a grand entrance, there will often be sweeping lawn pastures. We saw them uh, in the first slides. 
Capability Brown loved signature trees. He would typically put in some kind of a wooded area for his clients. He wanted it to be screened from the town so there'd be a perimeter shelter built for screens of trees. I will introduce you to some of his ha-has, some of his follies, and some of his water features. <laughs> so take a look at this illustration. You're gonna learn how to read a Capability Brown landscape by just following the circles one by one as I introduce them. So the first one is on the mansion. So you could imagine this as Highclere Castle, but he did this for, as you know, up to as many as 300 places. So he wanted the main estate to be prominent. And one way he did that was to make the entrances as far away as he could so that everyone would have a long way, if you will, or a long time in getting there. So the gateways were always as far away as you could, so you'd have this long meandering path to get to the, the house finally. Capability Brown was in love with the tree known as the Cedar of Lebanon, which is a, an absolutely gorgeous tree that I will show you. He also would create a woodland so that his clients could go out and ride their horses or uh, shoot. He would make those ha-has that you see in that lower circle, which served as a way to keep deer and other animals out, very clever. And he would often have a water feature, which would have some kind of a boathouse perhaps, or a bridge over it. He would do his best to camouflage the town nearby and he would put trees and shrubs around it so that no one in the castle would actually know how close they were to their neighboring town. And last but not least, he included something called a folly, which was, and I'll show you more of them, some kind of a beautiful structure that had a, uh, an aesthetic purpose in the garden or in his landscape. So these are the key features of every Capability Brown landscape, including Highclere Castle. This was uh, one of Brown's first, before he did Highclere, he worked here at the Stowe Estate. And I call your attention to a couple of those prominent features. There had been formal plants adjacent to and in front of that estate building. Brown wanted everyone to enjoy it without any interruption. So he cleared out the garden and the trees and the bushes that were in front of, or in some way, if you will, marred his view of the front estate. And then what he did was he sculpted that lawn and you can almost see the way it's cut to beautifully roll down and slope gently from one side to the other. That was not nature. That was Capability Brown and his crew smoothing out that land. And then he diverted a stream to make this beautiful water feature at the base of that lawn. This one is his design at Petworth. You see some of the same features, the reorientation of a waterway and, and clearing out anything that was shrubbery or trees in front of the estate. So there would be that beautiful lawn at Petworth. Here's another shot of Petworth from the distance. You see how that view is simple and uncluttered. Nothing is taking your vision away from the estate that sits higher on the property. So I guess what I want you to understand is these were not accidental choices. These were remaking the landscape so the entire properties would feel like parks. He did the same at Chatsworth. You see the waterway there. All right, another one. So you're getting a sense of what Capability Brown's designs look like. This was one at Longleat. 
uh, so attractive, they made uh, a stamp of it in England. But again, you're starting to see uh, ideas and um, notions that made Capability Brown famous. This is perhaps his most exquisite site. This is Blenheim Palace. It's now a world UNESCO site. And this was uh, the Churchill family home. And I've got a couple of images of this. You see it here. Brown created this lake. And of course, then he would have to add a bridge. But it was the addition of this lake that really sets this in English Landscape Garden apart because of how you would approach it. And I will show you. Here was the design for it. And here's what it looks like, right? Very dramatic, reorganizing the landscape to make something that would be called the English, or what we think or we know of as the English country garden. What we need to remember is that in days of old, that is when Capability Brown was doing his work, what was moving his trees into the landscape? These were beasts of burden. You know, they were just hauling these trees. There was no railroad yet. You know, I don't know anything about the sourcing. And we do know that he was placing rather large trees in the landscape and they used the wheel to help them, if you will, hold them up, hoist them, and then drop them into the holes on the property. Now, remember, all of this work is done essentially by hand with shovels and trowels. Yes, there's the wheel. Yes, you may have um, oxen pulling something, but for the most part, you've got a scythe in your hand or a trowel and you're redesigning a whole property on the scale that Capability Brown did. You know, it's pretty amazing when you think of it, when we all go to, you know, grab our clippers and they're electric or, you know, they're gas powered. And we're so happy for that, right? These huge, enormous estates were all done by hand. So this, as I said, the building that in 1771, uh, Capability Brown redesigned the whole garden for. But I've got to show you this, right? This is what you know as Highclere Castle. Take a look at the building you see that it now is a full three stories and then there are turrets above. Let me just go back again. You see how it was more like two and a half stories in the 1770s? And then it would become a full three stories in 1842. It was designed by the uh, British architect, Sir Charles Barry, and he put on the facade stone from Bath. It's absolutely beautiful. Take a look at this next slide. You may recognize the building on your left as none other than the British House of Parliament. Do you see the similarities with that and Highclere Castle? Okay, you may not have known it, but the exact same architect uh, did Highclere Castle. You see, there's not even 10 years between the design of the two, and many of those features are repeated in High Clare. And that's because Sir Charles Barry did both, uh, was the architect on both structures. And then I have to make a confession. High Clare Castle is rarely mentioned in many of the books that are about Capability Brown. Yes, there's usually a page or two reference and they talk about something on the estate. But my guess is, although famous for the Downton Abbey series, the property as an English country garden was not as dramatic as the others because there isn't a huge water feature as there is at Blenheim and Stowe, Petworth and the others. And that's why High Clare is not as well recognized as those others are. All the same, let's take a look at what he did at High Clare. So the grand entrance is important. You make it as far away as you can so that people have the visitors, if you will, have very long vistas as they approach uh, in the natural beauty. 
So that these three pathways that you see are the furthest points that you could imagine from the actual, uh, if you will, front door of Downton Abbey, of Highclere Castle. Whether you were coming on foot or you were coming on horseback or in a carriage or uh, as you know, uh, later in the series coming by vehicle, you know, by a moving vehicle that Tom might drive, nothing would interrupt your vision. Note that there's not a shrub, a tree, a bush, there's nothing there but lawn so that nothing is interfering with your vision of this beautiful castle that lies ahead. The second feature is the undulating lawn. Take a look at that scoop in the center and how it slopes from both left and right to that little dip in the middle. That was not naturally occurring. That was Capability Brown's design. So they smoothed that out to make it appear as beautiful and if you will, natural as it does. And there's another uh, picture of it with the, uh, you can see the monk's garden in the lower uh, right corner. I will say I'm very happy that Capability Brown did nothing with the monk's garden. My guess is if that garden had been closer to the front of the house, it might have come down. But because it was, if you will, a good distance away, uh, it, it remained standing. And then from the series, you may remember, uh, when Lady Edith went down for a walk, you would see, you could always see the castle from some distance because in fact, nothing is interfering with the view. She's at the bottom of that lawn area, which is now uh, planted with wildflowers. But again, you see the castle right there. Here, Mary and Tom, right? Some distance from the castle, they're out, I think, talking about the prospects of what could become of the property. Again, nothing is interfering with their view, no matter how far they are away. Again, it feels like a park. And this is an example of that signature tree that Brown loved to plant on his properties. It's known as a cedar of Lebanon, obviously not a native, but indeed uh, the first Earl of Carnarvon loved it too because of its majesty. And you will see how it has grown over the years, if you will, flanking uh, this area uh, on the uh, passageway to High Clare, really stately statements. Here you see uh, Isis is going for a walk uh, underneath one of those cedars of Lebanon. And here again. And again, those are some distance from the house. I don't want you to think that it's close up to the house uh, in any way. So the signature tree, Cedar of Lebanon, is on all of Capability Brown's properties. He also used other trees, like he liked um, uh, the uh, weeping beeches because they were dramatic, making a statement uh, wherever he would place them. What I want you to understand is, you and I might think, well, those trees naturally grew there. Each one of these were planted specifically to make a statement, whether they were punctuating the space, drawing attention to something, these were not accidental, or you know, they cleared the land and left a couple. These were planted for maximum effect. In the same way, he would plant a clump of trees, um, perhaps sometimes to break up the view or to hide something he didn't wish to see. Now, this is one of those ha-has that I mentioned. It, it is kind of a funny word, I know. Um, let me try to explain it. You dig a ditch, uh, plus or minus six to eight feet below the level of the ground. And then what you do is you, you make sure that ditch is on a slope. And so, as we know, deer, for instance, really can't climb beyond eight feet so that they would not be able to jump up on that area because of the ditch. Let me give you another uh, shot of it. Oh, where does the term come from? Many think it's from uh, King Louis, who when he saw this in France said, ha ha. And our own very uh, Thomas Jefferson 
looked at that first garden that I showed you, the garden at Stowe. And when our Thomas Jefferson was there, he said the enclosure is entirely by ha ha. And, and indeed the name has stuck. So here's what we're looking at. If you and I want to keep the deer out of our property, we might build a, put up a fence or a ledge of some kind. And then that would keep the deer out, but we'd always be looking at the fence or the hedge or whatever. We really couldn't see through it. The whole idea of a ha-ha was that ditch, six to eight feet, would be too wide for any animal to climb and get over. So that in fact, you as the person could view from a distance and see all of the deer or sheep or pigs grazing, but they could never get on your property. Ingenious, right? Uh, if we all had enough land, we could do this uh, to keep the deer out. So here is a ha ha at uh, one of uh, Brown sites at Barrington. You get a sense of it there. You see the, the brick uh, wall. And you see in each of these, a wall discreetly placed, usually reinforced by some kind of stone or brick. Uh, at this house at Burley, you can see the deer are not gonna get over that into the other lawn area, even though you could enjoy the deer from the estate because you can see them clearly, there's nothing blocking your view of them. And here is the haha -ha at High Clare. I didn't see it when I was watching the series, uh, but, but in fact, there it is. So deer could get as close as the beginning, if you will, of that red arrow, but not jump over uh, into uh, the property. And I will say, and I, and I show you this fence that's here now, and that was added because of the numbers of tourists that come to High Clare, and they didn't want anybody accidentally, you know, looking over and, and uh, inadvertently uh, tipping into that area. But it would not have that fence or a fence would not be needed in its day. Brown, as I said, knew who was paying uh, the money in his pocket. And he knew what his wealthy clients enjoyed doing. They had plenty of leisure time because if you will, none of them worked at jobs, right? So they would go out shooting, they'd go hunting, they might go riding on horses or out in their carriage. And Brown wanted them to be able to do so not far away, but right on their property, right on their estate, his English country garden. So to, what he would do is, um, and I'll just explain that, he would make what was called a woodland belt. That's a group of trees he's planted together even though they're tightly connected, he made it look as if, or appear as if it was more extensive than it really is, giving the estate a really sense of being in its own world. And you can see here the, the dark green areas, those are the wooded belts that he created on the property uh, to indeed you know, give it a sense of isolation from the rest of the world. And indeed, the town that was nearby that nobody really would ever see. You know, there's a sense of that uh, wooded area. So that Lady Mary and company could go up and they could shoot of a day right on their own property. Or they could go riding. And you see a cedar of Lebanon right there uh, in the distance on the left. Or go out on the hunt. So they never had to leave home, if you will, because in fact, home was never far away uh, when they were going on on that uh, hunt. And then let me talk about the follies. So follies are usually very attractive and oftentimes ancient Greek or Roman in their styling. And right now we're looking at a Pantheon, that building that you see right over the water at a place known as Stourhead. I have to tell you a funny story. Like all Pantheons, like all Follies, the whole idea was to bring 
eyes out to the vista. You know, if you're gonna create this wonderful, massive English country garden, you've got to let your eye catch on something so it doesn't wander. So it was often the case that Brown would put one of these follies adjacent to or near a waterway to make it appear even more beautiful than it was. It might even be a place where you'd go and stop or have a moment of reflection. It was always decorative. It might even have been functional because there might have been a bench or a chair in there, a place to rest while walking around the park grounds. So let me back up. So you were only looking at that portion of the folly. Now, what does it look like? Oh my goodness, exquisite, right? So you see how the water feature actually allows that uh, folly to be reflected in the water. You see the wonderful bridge across and then plantings all around. Well, here's the story I wanna tell you. There was a banker by the name of Henry Hore, who was so taken by everything that Capability Brown did that he copied his style and he and his gardeners tried to make their own, if you will, quote unquote, Capability Brown garden on their own property because he indeed, he indeed did have a water feature there. He was very successful at, if you will, uh, copying the uh, best form of flattery. So back at High Clare, what are the actual follies? Well, this one is known as Heaven's Gate. And I love its name. And when you understand the property, you know why it's called Heaven's Gate. It's at the one of the higher points at the, on the High Clare Estate. And if it's only that one kind of will, uh, three arches of a wall, put your eye in the center arch. And if you look down, what's not in any way being covered, right? You can see a clear view of High Clare Castle. But let me give you a shot to give you a sense of what we're talking about in terms of space. All right. The little circle that you see here, uh, the oval on the left, that's where Heaven's Gate is looking at High Clare. Another picture of it here. So it was called Heaven's Gate because indeed it was at that highest point on the property, but it was by Capability Brown placed there so that you would have this beautiful unobstructed view of the castle should you be up at Heaven's Gate. Another very handsome folly that Capability Brown built was known as Jack Dawes Castle. So you could go to Jack Dawes Castle, that's that um, white structure that you see uh, in, in the lower part of the left image with the beautiful columns. It in fact uh, is often used or has been used for parties and gatherings and romantic uh, liaisons over the years. That's what it looks like. It never had a roof. It's not supposed to have a roof. Again, it's a folly. It's just to make you think of something. That's another uh, you know, very pretty picture of it in a different season. And indeed, Lady Edith would meet her to-be husband here to talk about, you know, Lord knows what. Now, you see that the castle is behind you, right? Or behind Jack Dawes, the High Clare Castle. Think about how much space separates these two. Right, looks pretty close, yes? because we there's nothing interfering with your view of High Clare. Look at how far it is in reality. It's much further even than the monk's garden is. But again, Capability Brown was very clever in making sure it lined up with and could be seen both from the castle and then Jack Daw, you could look back and see High Clare. So these were all very intentional follies. Another one he put down, this is by now the Wood of Goodwill in Etruscan Temple. And then another folly, the very pretty Temple of Diana. My guess is he cited this folly here 
because he wanted to draw attention to the water. That's the only little bit of water that is at High Clare Castle. And my guess is he tried to move heaven and earth <laughs> to get it closer to the, the main estate, but he couldn't do so. So instead put this beautiful folly here. All right, so this gives you a sense now that High Clare Castle Garden is the entire property. And you now have a much better understanding of what in fact is an English country garden or the English uh, landscape garden. I need to say something about uh, Humphrey Repton who would be one of the followers of um, uh, Capability Brown. He like uh, Brown is highly regarded in England. Um, there was a recent celebration of Brown's birth and Repton's death that kind of coincided. What made Repton perhaps more memorable than Brown was that he was an artist. You were looking at Repton's business card. Isn't that a thing of beauty? Repton believed in many of Capability Brown's ideas and what made him so successful was that Repton as an artist would create whole books of pages of illustrations for a particular client. And then he would paint them so that they would be absolutely illustrated, beautiful watercolor books. They became known as red books because as you see from that uh, image on the top, he used uh, the red Morocco kind of fabric covering uh, as the front and back cover. And this is what Repton's designs look like. You see open and lean, much like uh, Capability Brown, but we can look at this today because he was also an illustrator making these books. Sheeringham is often considered Repton's uh, finest work, and this was his secret. He used overlays so that you could kind of see the before and the after when he would redesign your property. If Brown's success was he was a large scale contractor who actually designed and implemented all of his, design, his uh, landscape ideas, Repton made more of his money by charging a ton for those red books. So not as many people ultimately employed him, but he had a generous revenue from uh, making his clients feel happy about this book, which was essentially about their property. Um, so he liked the bear and the bold of uh, Repton and he liked the water features. So this is a Repton. Take a look at the before. Take a look at the after. He did just what Brown did, right? As you see, introduced a water feature and a bridge over it. I'll go back. Same spot, redesigned. And so he would share with his client what could uh, happen in the property and they often loved it. He did, however, introduce some other features that were more fancy and fussy. Uh, we can see here, that this is a Repton design and not a uh, brown because it's just way too much in front of the castle and around it, right? See all of those bushes and shrubs. Uh, and, and he would indeed in other gardens have generally Brown's basic idea and then would, if you will, start filling up around the house. But he may be better known than Brown because of the marketing of those uh, many books. And there are some in the New York area. I believe the Pierpont Library has one or two, as does our New York uh, Botanical uh, Garden. So to say then, as many of us would say that Shakespeare has done a great deal for English literature, so Capability Brown did in fact for the English landscape. And yet it may be because he made his landscapes look so natural that 
it's hard to imagine that someone actually and his crew created that. So we may not be as aware of Brown because he made what looks like, oh my goodness, nature did a beautiful job of this particular uh, landscape. It's also true that Capability Brown um, was followed by the designer of Central Park, our Frederick Law Olmsted that you see here on the right. Uh, Olmsted won the design uh, in the 1800s and he would go to England and study Capability Brown's designs. Because uh, he also did not like what was happening with Victorian uh, arrangements of plants. Olmsted liked big landscape effects. He liked waterways, lakes, and rambles. And any of you have walked through Central Park, you know exactly uh, what I'm talking about, right? So there's a design for um, uh, the park, if you will, right? There, there was one of Capabilities designs on the right. New York was already pretty well formed, so he had to work in that long, big rectangle. But if you know anything about a park, our Central Park, there's all kinds of meandering pathways over water throughout, uh, thanks in part to the influence that Olmsted had uh, from Capability Brown. And that brings to a conclusion this uh, portion of um, our discussion of High Clare Castle. I encourage any of you to uh, look at the Suffolk County Library collection. You have terrific books available to you if not at the um, uh, Middle Country Library through Interlibrary Loan, Sarah Rutherford's Capability Brown and his Landscape Garden. Steffi Shield talks about all of the work that went into moving, if you will, all of the land uh, masses, which would today represent environmental degradation. John Phipps has written two books, the one Capability Brown you see here and Placemaking as you see uh, in the far left. No Relation Jane Brown also has a book on Capability Brown, as does Lawyer My Laura Meyer. So there's much about the English landscape garden that we know of or know through uh, looking at the television series. And if any of you want to uh, compare Capability Brown to Humphrey Repton, uh, here's an older book that's available to you. All right, so I'm about to segue uh, to join all of you, I welcome you at this point in time to either open up your um, uh, video, open up your microphones, and uh, I don't know if we, if this is a, uh, if I'm able to uh, see you or whether or not uh, we can look at comments that is that are available through um, the uh, the chat. Amber, can you see some of those? I, I, I yeah, I don't actually see any questions. Okay, so one is, what is the purpose of two and a half? I'm not sure what the uh, case of two and a half stories was, but obviously that was a, a landscape choice, a design choice on the architecture. Yeah, that's the only question I saw so far in just some comments earlier. But if anyone has any questions, go ahead and um, type them in. I can certainly, um, you know, share the references uh, with Amber, uh, who can share them uh, with all of you. Yes. Sure. Absolutely. Some thank yous. Okay. Coming through. I, I recognize some of the names in there. I see Veronica. Was it Teresa or Elizabeth that I see? I know some of these names. I'm, I'm curious, um, have any of you been to High Clare? Is, is anyone in the audience been there? Whether or not you've been, the next time you watch PBS, you might be watching a television show. It might be a series or something else. And what's great is you will say to yourself, oh my goodness, that is, I was watching an, an old episode of Inspector Morse. I said, oh my goodness. They film that, they take that at one of the Capability Brown English country estates. So that was absolutely terrific. Okay, um, it looks like Kim wanted to ask her question um, verbally so I could unmute her if that's okay with you, Roxanne. Yep, yep. 
Kim, I unmuted you. Thank you very much. I had a, a little bit of a story and it was just going to take too long to type. Um, I work for a company that is global and we have a location down on uh, near Southampton in England, south of London. And my coworkers there have told me that Highclere has a lot of events and that they go up there often and sit on those great lawns and have all sorts of you know, community events and mini concerts and fireworks and stuff. So if you lived locally, you got you would get to go there quite often. Right. And if I can just add to that, Kim, thank you for that. Um, it may ha seem hard for us to imagine that anyone who has an estate as large and as prosperous as that would be on hard times. But it is true that the Downton Abbey series brought unrivaled attention to Highclere and the, and the Carnarvon family has made the most of it. They're selling now Downton Abbey oats and Downton Abbey cereal and come to spend the weekend at Downton Abbey. And as you say, all kinds of festivals and events and tours so that the television series really did help them. And apparently some of that money is going to renovations on the second and third floors, which had been put off for a, a long time. So, uh, so thanks to, to the series, in, indeed, Downton Abbey, a.k.a. Highclere Castle, has enjoyed renewed life and vitality in that neighborhood. And apparently you can rent rooms, you know, you can stay overnight at bed and breakfast, like, you know, in, in a room there. Uh, it's a lot of fun. Okay, um, and I do know there, there are questions about the uh, program. Some of you may know that the librarians in Suffolk County are fantastic and that different libraries host different programs uh, often every, any night of the week. I believe I'm doing this talk uh, a couple of times uh, this month. Uh, let's see. Uh, where am I going to be? Uh, I'll be in Northport uh, doing Downton Abbey on January 20th, and we're doing other talks on winter seed sowing. So that any of you are welcome to come to the talks. You need the uh, link provided generously by the local librarian, and you can find that information on the Cornell Suffolk website. So it's CCE Suffolk gardening, and then you'll see the events on the right-hand side. And then in fact, you can uh, you know, see who, which library is offering it and then ask uh, the librarian uh, uh, if, whether or not you can come in. And most are wonderful like Amber and they welcome you with open arms. <laughs> 